All right, we're getting ready to get started in just a moment. Welcome, welcome. How is everybody? We're all spread out around the room, so. I did about marriage, I know. I cannot coax people forward. I have tried every trick I know, so sorry, guys. They like to be Baptist. They like to sit way in the back. Back row Baptist. The idea is the further back I sit, the less likely it is that you'll call on me. That is, that is what that is. So, um, anyway, a couple of things quickly before we get started. Um, if you did get handouts, they're on the table right here to my right, your left. Uh, there are two handouts. One is the week six. We're on week six. Yes, week six notes. The other says communication tips. This is from last week. Uh, Rick and Snoop gave some incredible tips for communication that were not in your notes. And I saw many of you like carrying holes in your paper trying to write them down and you could not keep up. And so they graciously put them in a document for you so you now have those. So you can stick those in your week five notes and you are all caught up, okay? So that's what you've got. Tonight is going to be a really fun night. We are talking about roles within marriage. So this will be a great topic here and I think uh, promote some really fun conversation at home. So it should be a fun night. I'm gonna keep my mic handy tonight uh, and sit close to Pastor Jason so that if we need a what Sue meant to say moment, we can throw that in, okay? Um, so we'll be ready with those if necessary, all right? Hey, let me pray for us, and I come on to Pastor Jason to pray for us, and we will get started, okay? Yeah. All right, let's pray, guys. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for the beautiful design of marriage and for your word and your instruction to us. Uh, we thank you for Rick and Sue and their uh, uh, courage and all that they have done to press into and to lead us. Uh, in, in the topic of marriage, and I, and I thank you for them and what they need to our church. And so, God, we just pray for your wisdom. We, we want our marriages to honor and to glorify you uh, and to picture the gospel. And we acknowledge up front that we are a work in progress, and our relationships are a work in progress. Uh, but we certainly want them to shine the light of the gospel. And so help us to, uh, wherever we are in our process tonight, to be able to submit to you and the Holy Spirit and say, convict us, help us, continue to, to make us grow uh, more into your image. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome. Well, uh, oh, I thought for sure, Pastor, that I was going to mute my mic, man. I thought for sure. All right. So, just by way of review, I want to remind you, week one, we talked about myths and truths. We also talked about covenant and contract and how easy it is to think contractually in our marriage. We hope that spurred a lot of good conversation about where we are in terms of our thinking about marriage. We also did a quiz, if you recall. By the way, that quiz has a front and back page. You might want to pull that out periodically and see where we are and how you're doing on that. Then in week two, we went into communication and conflict resolution. Um, but we started that with an exercise on proof of the spirit and thorns of the flesh. And the key takeaway there was whoever directs our thinking will direct our actions and our behaviors. And I hope that was a convicting exercise that made you think about where am I in my walk? We also then, there were some key takeaways there. Our words should unite, not divide. Remember team us, we love team us. Um, and unresolved conflict does not go away. Remember, we talked about that pile of unresolved conflict. It doesn't go away, and it, it ends up being lobbed into every argument unless we work on unresolved conflict. Uh, another thing, two points I want to make. We will repeat stuff. Now, part of that is because we're of senior age, but more importantly, we will repeat stuff 
purposely because that's what the world does. That what, that's what Satan does. He bombards us with our with culture and cultural untruths, biblical untruths, and it's just this constant drumbeat. So we want to do the same when we talk about marriage. We want to constantly talk about God's truths so that when you hear something, you can instantly know, is that, is that biblically sound or not? And then we also, especially tonight, we're going to talk gender specifics. We're going to talk about the genders, male and female. And so there will, by, by the very nature of that discussion, there will be some, these are normal, this is habitual behavior for males and females, right? Now, it doesn't say that that's 100%. We, we've had couples where the roles were somewhat reversed. Um, and a lot of that, I think, has to do with nurture as opposed to nature. And so just extrapolate from that. So tonight, we are talking about roles in marriage. And here's what I want you to think about. On the very first night we met, we talked about who designed marriage. Right answer. You, you can say it a little more emphatically, you know? <laughs> You're right, right? You, there's, you are correct. God designed marriage. So if he designed marriage, do you think he has something to say about our role in marriage? as a husband, as a wife, you bet. our job in this world? And the answer is yes, Absolutely. he does. And so tonight we're going to dive into that. But Some of what ahead. we share, Sorry. I can real quick. Thank you. Sorry. Some of what we share is God's truth, but it might be tough to hear. It might be tough because the world view has affected our thinking. And I will be honest about my walk to take on the role of being a wife is very candidly a lifelong journey of sanctification. And I have got a long way to go. But if we can be open to what God says and honestly and lovingly and prayerfully talk about it, it'll be a great night. Now, for any of people who saw the movie Night and Day with Tom Cruise, you may not have seen it, but there is a little gesture my husband and I use. Every husband and wife has little pet names and pet gestures. So one of those comments are, you're either with me or you're without me, with me and without me. That affects conflict, that affects communication. Think of that as your relationship with God. We are either with him or we're not with him, right? And so we're going to be referring to that. Okay, so that's a good segue. I want to read something, and this is from Preparing for Marriage. It's a family life resource, and it says this. In our culture today, we see a backlash against traditional roles. The idea that the husband should be the leader in a marriage is seen as unjust, confining, cruel, and antiquated. Women have been encouraged to be more assertive and independent in marriage and to seek fulfillment in their careers. In many circles, a mother who stays at home with her children is often portrayed as unintelligent and boring, wasting her time doing housework. That's the culture, right? That's the drumbeat we hear from the culture today. But few people are happy with the way responsibilities in many marriages are handled today. As women become more assertive in the marriage relationship, many men have become increasingly passive in their homes. Women then become less respectful of their husbands, and husbands in turn show less uh, love for their wives. Meanwhile, as our society grows more sexually ambiguous, boys and girls grow up with, a little, concept, with little concept of what it means to be a man or woman. It's time to understand what the Bible says, and that's where we want to start. 65. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> yeah, we're young and just young and 65. Still wet. Started even Medicare. Near. It's a whole new world. It is. Let me tell you. Whole new world. Whole new world. All right. But first, let's start with a little humor. We love to insert a little humor. Tim Hawkins. I love marriage. Marriage is awesome. It's so beneficial. So many benefits for a guy when you get married. <laughs> when you get married, you're a guy. You get a little helper in the car. <laughs> I love my little helper in the car. She knows everything about driving. It's very convenient for me. <laughs> but sometimes I get confused. See, I don't know how I get anywhere without my helper in the car. I'd probably be bouncing off trees and buildings and stuff, but she's there to help. Like she tells me when the light changes colors and everything, it's very convenient and helpful. <laughs> uh -huh. Like it's green, thank you, Albert. Because I was confused, I didn't know. Thanks, Captain Prism. He's very helpful in the car for me. I always know how fast I'm going with my helper. He lets me know. You know how fast you're going? Yeah, I got a speedometer right here, but thanks for the backup. That thing ever snaps in half, I got you to back me up. When you see old guys driving 35 on the freeway, it's not because they want to, they've been trained to, for crying out loud. Their foot has been governed by a woman. You ever see like, oh, I want to go faster. I just don't think I should. I just feel like something horrible is going to happen if I go any lower. Going to get an ice pick in my ear hole or something bad's going to happen, Lloyd. He's very helpful in the car. That's right. She gives me statistics when we're in a car. That's right. You know that men have the most accidents. Gee, I wonder why that is. Hmm. Let me ponder that for a nanosecond. Bing! It's because the woman in the passenger side, because you always react to every little thing. And that's okay. Just don't do the noise. What was that? That was the garage door opening, sweetheart. I, we haven't left yet. Can you give me a change of pants before we go? I'm, these aren't gonna work for the gala. I'm sorry, with silver was moving. I thought it was a Volvo. I'm sorry. We were driving one night. <laughs> we were driving one night, it's like two o'clock in the morning. And it's just, I'm just so tired. I'm just hallucinating. My wife's just sacked out. She got that eyelid. And we hit a bump. Two o'clock in the morning, she goes. Are you okay? <laughs> and she says this, you want me to drive? <laughs> What would Jesus do? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh. All right. Love Tim Hawkins. I, have per I had permission, by the way, ladies, to, to show that. My wife approved yeah. of that video. I tried so hard to take offense, but it is so true. <laughs> I do that all the time. So who am I? All right. We follow humor with, of course, God's word. And I think uh, you're, you're familiar. This is kind of, if, if there was a... Um, doctoral thesis on marriage in the Bible, it would be Ephesians 5. Uh, usually the verses uh, cited are 22 through 33. We want to add 21 to that, for, to, and you'll see why in a second. But these are the verses that are usually read at marriages and, and, and preached on uh, about marriage. And so let's, let's talk about what God says about marriage. Go ahead, darling. Starting with verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ 
is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. He goes on, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, so let's, let's look at this in a little more detail. So guys. We are now on one of your handout pages. You should see this. Yes, this is your first handout, I believe. So Ephesians 5.23, for a husband is, is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is savior. So there's the first thing, guys, that, that God tells us. We are the head of the house. This is spiritual head. This isn't dictatorship for life. This is spiritual head of the home. The next thing he tells us is that we are to uh, love our wives as Christ loved the church. So there is sacrificial love, agape love, with a, with a servant's, servant heart. Then number th first Peter three, seven, this is probably one of the most vilified passages in the Bible. The women's movement of the sixties and seventies said this verse was terrible. Your husband should live with you, uh, with your wives in an understanding way, since they are the weaker vessel. You should show them respect because God gives them the same blessing. He gives you the grace of true life. Do this so that nothing will stop your prayers from being heard. So a couple things on this. This is a verse commanding husbands to live with their wives in an understanding way. You won't find a verse in the Bible that says, wives, live with your husbands in an understanding way. Why is that? Because you do that by your very nature. God's designed you to do that. We're a little defective in that area, and we need guidance. We need to be directed to live with our wives in an understanding way. And then he says, he says this curious thing because they are the weaker vessel. Now, that's not comparing women to men. This is comparing wives to husbands, and it's doing so in this area of understanding. And think of it, if, if, if a mental image will help here, think of men as a bucket or a, um, you know. Clay pot. Clay pot. <laughs> and think of your wife as this fine crystal vase. Yes. We have a bucket and then this beautiful crystal. So, delicate. And so our yeah. wives in the area of understanding are are much more vulnerable. And so they need to be understood. That's what this verse says. It's a beautiful verse. It's not a misogynistic verse at all. It's a beautiful verse that talks about the, the woman's femininity and her uh, need to be understood. And then God says, this is so important. I'm going to add a rider onto the end of this. Uh, you got to do this so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You think that makes that pretty important? Absolutely. And then the last verse I want to share is Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Same thing. You won't find a verse in the Bible that says, wives, respect your husbands and don't be harsh with them. So why does God tell us to do this? I, I think most men realize in here, when we talk, when we banter back and forth, we, we can be pretty harsh harsh in our bantering. That's what guys do. It's kind of one upsmanship. It's back and forth. Sometimes when women hear guys bantering, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that. And then five minutes later, they're slapping each other on the back. So men have this conversation that goes on that does not belong in the same conversation with your wives because they will take it differently. It can be taken harsh. And so we need 
some guardrails here that we need not to be harsh with our wives. Let me make uh, just a couple of points from my perspective. When we experience conflict, I think one of the things I hear from men a lot is something like, I just don't understand you. Can you relate? <laughs> Have you heard that? Right? Can we and get them? Yet, so God doesn't need to command you what to do when he designs you to be that way. Wives. So, so he is telling husbands to live your life in an understanding way. Okay. We might be young to you, sir, but we've been married a long time, 40 years, 40 years. And this man is still trying to figure me out and live with me in an understanding way. And just when he thinks he's getting there, she changes the rules. Okay. Of course I do. It's what I do. It comes naturally. The second thing that happens, this idea of do not be harsh for me, I tend to personalize things. God designed us for relationships, and I'm longing for this connection with my husband. And when he's harsh, the first thing I say is, what did I do? I assume I've done something, and I personalize it. And if my husband won't talk about it, whatever it is, and he pushes it down, he may not understand how that affects Team Us. Amen. All right, so let's summarize these things. And you have this sheet, your next sheet. These are the categories that men are responsible for. Love and sacrifice. Another word there, guys, would be, or ladies, serve and sacrifice. A lot of times this word love becomes this all-encompassing word, and no one really understands that. But there's this element of service there. So we are to serve and to sacrifice. We already talked a little bit about headship. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but that leadership role. Provision and protection. In the garden, when Adam and Eve got kicked out, God said to Adam that you, you will toil in the earth from which you came. Okay, so there's this built in in our DNA to provide and to protect. The other point about that same verse is when sin entered, and God came to that couple. You heard my husband say, did he go to Eve? No, he went to Adam. Adam, where and he are asked, you? asked, Adam, where are you? We will talk more about headship, but a part of that, they both had sinned. And yet he went to the head. He went to Adam. Emotional support and companionship. That's that idea of living with your wife in an understanding way, that emotional support. Men, your wife has a need for emotional release, emotional uh, to talk about her emotions that you don't necessarily have. Is that okay that she has a need that you don't have? Absolutely, because in a little bit, we're going to talk about a need that men have that women don't necessarily have. And the last one, again, just to reiterate that leadership, headship role, spiritual guidance in the home. All right, so let's talk about headship. And there's a quick summary of the things we've already talked about. Headship does not mean unlimited monarchy or dictator for life. He is to cherish and nurture his wife as his own body. We talked about not being harsh. We talked about living with your wife in an understanding way. And then that last part is sacrificial love, to serve and sacrifice in the marriage. In other words, guys, that's right. You get to be Jesus to your wife. You get to be Jesus in your marriage. You think we need help with this? Yes. Take it away, my darling. <laughs> Y'all, headship is tough. And I'm going to talk about wives. And, and we, too, have some issues that we need to talk about as a church family. So now we're looking at God's design Let me make one for more marriage. Point. I, I left out one point on that headship. And that headship is a responsibility, not a right. And most men at least 
evangelical Christian men see this as a responsibility. It's a heavy responsibility that we will be held accountable for one day. It's not a right, it's a responsibility. Well said, babe, thank you. Imagine what these discussion time is gonna be as we get y'all to talk about these things, right? It's very, uh, heavy very duty convicting. stuff. So now, God's design for marriage in the guidance to the wives. Ladies, we are going to talk about a word, starts with an S, and it ends with a mission. <laughs> and for many in the world view, the world sees this as a four letter word. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. We'll spend some time focusing on it. But God sees it as a word of beauty, as a word of a purposeful choice of obedience out of love and reverence for Christ. So we will talk about that. The first ones, uh, as you look at this and you have it as a handout, it's in Ephesians your first handout. 5 talks first about handout. wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. The wife must respect her husband. Okay, now, so let me ask a question. Ladies, are we to submit to all men? No. Why do you say that? What does God's word say? To our husbands, right? And my husband already talked about it is not an issue of domination. This idea of honoring God's design and what he says about our job as wives is incredibly important. For me, my husband is charged to be Jesus Christ in our home, to love me above all others, to sacrifice for me to serve for me, to live with me in an understanding way, despite my actions or my words, to be the spiritual leader that we as a couple, our family, each other, draw closer to our Lord. Why would I not gladly submit to that? That is amazing. And we will talk more about that. Then you look at 1 Peter, wives in the same way, be submissive to your husband so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. How sobering is that? We have friends in our growth group who talk about how we share God's love to our world. And may we be a light that shines and if necessary, use words. So out of obedience and reverence to God, does my behavior demonstrate to my man that I am striving to honor my God? This idea of submission is a choice that we make. Right? It is purposeful. The last verse goes and talks about Proverbs 31. We've used the last verse of it, but read the last half of Proverbs after the discussion for the king. We, he, God talks about, Solomon talks about a wife of noble character, how precious she is. And I will confess in my walk, as I draw closer to God early on, I struggled with submission. We'll talk about that. And I would read Proverbs 31 and I'd go, this is absolutely impossible. No way. I used to go like, do we have to read Proverbs 31 really, please? You know, I did not treat it with love and eagerness. And yet I can see how my husband, when I am obedient to God and I purposely choose to lift him up, how important that is. So let me give you a couple of examples of biblical responsibilities of a wife. And you can see this in your notes. 
Biblical responsibilities, yeah, of a wife. So I have another slide on submission, and we'll go into that in just a minute. Respect and honor. Again, I said earlier, I am commanded by God to respect my husband. So it must not come naturally for me. I must purposely choose to honor, regardless of his behavior, regardless of his actions. I am commanded by my God. So am I with him or am I without him? You have to ask yourself. And our pastor talks about when we are blessed and are privileged to come before our God with communion and to ask God, show me, show me where I have not honored you and I have strayed and I have sinned. This is the same thing. Show me as a wife, Lord, where I am not providing honor and I'm not respecting. And again, we'll get into more specifics about what that looks like to give you ideas for discussion. Naturally, to love and support my man. Okay. I've got to share a quick story uh, from Sacred Marriage, uh, built a uh, Sacred Marriage, Gary Thomas, right? And so the story goes, he is with a group of young women. And he asks them. He, Gary Thomas. He, Gary Thomas, the, lead, the person who leads Sacred Marriage. That is being taught in one of our growth groups right now. I'm looking at Lacey and just a great study. And he asks these young ladies, newly married, talk to me about your husband. Oh, and they light up. And they talk about how strong he is, and how he's a provider, and how wonderful he is, and how patient he is, and all of these glowing things about his strengths. And then he talks to another group of women, women who've been married, ooh, 40 years, maybe? Oops. Ooh, 40 years. Not even that. Time has passed. And these same women, he asks the exact same question. Talk to me about your husband. He never helps me around the house. He always leaves his underwear out on the floor, if you remember the humor of last week. We no longer talk. He doesn't listen to me. He never understands me. And so Gary asks the question, ladies, what happened? What happened that you used to talk about the strengths of your husband, and now you talk about what he isn't? what he is before God and what he isn't. Very convicting. We are designed to be a helpmate. Adam was raised out of the dust. We were designed as an equal partner. We are both individually gifted by God. And that's the power of team us and the power of God's design that you look at the role of the husband. And what he does and how God has gifted him. And you look at the role of the wife and what she does and how she supports. And that strength of character as described in uh, Proverbs 31. And you have God in the center. Oh, yeah. It's an unstoppable, amazing combination. And we, too, have a responsibility for prayer. We, too, have a responsibility to pray for our husband, to pray for our children, to pray for our family. Spiritual nurturing. Remember what was said earlier about supporting and at times by your behavior and at times use words. That is the importance of helping to nurture. This headship stuff, that's tough, right? Of course, we want to pray. I want to give an example specifically on this area right here of sp spiritual nurturing, because uh, I know a lot of guys, as when they're told they're the spiritual head of the home, they're like, but my wife knows more about the Bible than I do. Okay. And, and that can be very daunting. Let me give you an example in my own marriage. So when we first got married, and we would be in a Bible study, and I was asked to pray, I was very self-conscious of praying in public. I did not like it. I was uncomfortable praying in public. My wife was very good at it. Sue was very good at it. So it would have been easy for Sue to say, hey, 
you're embarrassing us. Or, hey, I got this. Let me do this. But she knew that that was not the right thing to do. In fact, so she would say to me, honey, don't worry about all the right words and all the these and the thous. Just pray what God lays on your heart. Just pray what God lays on your heart. And she would do that time and time again. That spiritual nurturing where she was that helpmate came alongside and encouraged. It's so important. If she had said, you're embarrassing me, let me do it. It would have been very easy to be what I talked about at that first paragraph. Be that, be that passive husband who just says, okay, you got it. I'll go play golf, right? It's very important, the role that you play to to bolster and spiritually nurture your husband. Thanks, babe. That's very kind. I've got to be honest and say I'm not always that way. There are times when I try very hard to be the Holy Spirit for my husband. <laughs> Can anybody relate that no. we, like, if there's a pause, we'll step in. No, we got it. We'll do it. We'll take over. We'll guide and direct. We don't give a chance. Maybe it's because I am controlling. Dare I say that out loud? I can be controlling. And so we do not look at how, as a helpmate, I can come along beside my man and lift him up and encourage. I would like to read an excerpt from a book, one of the resources. It is called Preparing for Marriage. It's published by uh, family Life, and it's a series of various authors. And this one uh, is just a paragraph. I'll read it quickly, and it, I think it will resonate with you. These passages that I've laid out and described uh, speak of a wife's responsibility to demonstrate love for her husband by respecting and supporting him. Respect is a choice to receive your husband in spite of his weaknesses, supporting your husband, being subject or submissive to his leadership is a choice to compliment him rather than compete with him. It does not mean you are inferior, that you lose your identity or that you ignore your own gifts. And it does not mean you blindly obey or submit to verbal or physical abuse, and it does not mean following your husband into sin. Instead, it means giving up your desire to control and, and cooperate with him as he seeks to lead your marriage and family. John Piper writes, submission is the divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. It is an attitude that says, I delight for you to take the initiative in our family. I am glad when you take responsibility for things and lead with love. I don't flourish in the relationship when you are passive and I have to make sure our family works. How many of us would gladly submit to the servant leader in our home. And I just want to uh, throw in something about this idea of respect. And I want ladies to, to, to walk away with this thought. A man who is deeply respected and honored in his home will do two things. He'll serve and he'll sacrifice. He'll serve and he'll sacrifice. You watch a man when he watches a movie, right? Braveheart or Gladiator, Saving Private Ryan. This idea of service is wired into our DNA. This idea of giving our lives for the greater good or for, for our fellow man is wired into our DNA. This idea of being respected is wired into our DNA. And I just want to leave you with that thought that a man who is deeply respected in his home will serve and sacrifice. That is so true. Uh, babe, if it's okay, I'd like to insert one point of humor on that, just because this is a sobering topic and we need to give it the attention that God has designed for us. We are referring to a resource called Love and Respect, and we'll talk more about that. It is excellent. 
But in that, uh, Emerson Egrich, the author and uh, the person who does it, there's, he inserts a lot of humor, and he talks about men's ability and willingness to die for their husbands. And so where the humor comes in, so the husband comes to his wife and he said, babe, I would die for you. And she goes, yeah, I hear you say that all the time, but you never do. Boom, boom. Psh. Come on, y'all. Uh, come on. That has to be a little. You funny. say that, but you never, you never do. do. Yes. Yeah, good point. Yes. No, it's a great point, all right? So Sue and I were both on active duty. We were both military intelligence officers. And halfway through our career, Sue's career started, I, I had a successful career, but Sue had a meteoric career. She was an early promotion to major, early promotion to lieutenant colonel, and on to colonel, okay? I retired as a lieutenant colonel. So do you think there was maybe uh, some struggle there? Absolutely, uh, but I will tell you, and I'll brag on my wife through all of that. Actually, I think that, that all of that just helped that need for her to, to find herself. And so when she came home, she didn't need to be the leader of the home. She didn't need to exert herself and, and to exert. She was perfectly com comfortable when she was at home to be my wife. And when people would say comments like, oh, I, I remember this vividly, you know, some guy, would, oh, do you salute your wife when you go to bed? And, and she would say, I could try that one time and that's it. Right. So it, it, it was different. Right. She, she, she understood clearly that where, what I am at work is totally different than the role that God asks of me in my home. Isn't that cool? So that's pretty neat. Good question, though. Thank you. A couple of thoughts on that. So um, our walk with our God took off uh, when we'd been, we were in our late 30s, right? And, and God was good, and I was blessed uh, with, with uh, recognition in the workforce. And I was privileged to lead large organizations I commanded at the company, battalion, and group. Yeah. Think of it as a brigade level. And so uh, one thing it helped is because I work with men, uh, in some ways it's easier to talk to men. It's, <laughs> it's like you can get to the point right away. Uh, I understood and saw and witnessed the need and desire for respect and how important that was. And I also saw how the guys would tease my man, and he took it. He took it. But God got a hold of us just in time. And I would pray every day to let me see people through his eyes. And so I learned that my man can fight his own battles. There is no question in my mind. But to have me step out and say, uh, I could try it one time. Right. I might get away with it once, but I better outrun him after that. Just to insert the humor just made a point that we recognized and we praise God that we recognized that at that juncture in our marriage to learn how important it was. It was also, thank you for us. It was also cool to have a, a wife in the military because she learned give the bottom line up front. And we know God loves, or guys love, the bottom line up front. Okay, uh, we digress. Yes, here are uh, two statements that you can read. The last bottom statement, I highlight it because this was taken from a biblical counselor, okay, out of a study, and it talks about the power of a wife's respect admiration and cooperation with her, uh, for her husband. 
and how when that happens, how it motivates her man. And it is just so true. Okay, we want to give you a little clip. For, we talked about Emerson Egerich and love and respect. Um, he's going he's gonna to give us some key components of this thing called love and respect that we found in Ephesians chapter 5. You have this sheet that's your next handout. It says love and respect at the top. How is it that we do this loving and respectful thing, especially when we don't want to? Well, I'm going to share some things with you that are simple. This is really kind of simple. God never intended it to be complex. It's very simple and it works. It takes a little work, but it works. Now, what are these expressions that some have said that changed the course of their marriage have really been life changing expressions? We're going to be looking at five of them, five of these expressions. Here's the first one, pink and blue, not wrong, just different. Pink and blue, not wrong, just different. In other words, she's not wrong for needing love, especially during conflict. And he's not wrong for needing respect, especially during conflict. And we're going to unpack this respect idea because it's been removed from the marital radar screen. But the word of God and the best research points out that there are gender differences. And if we don't understand that, we're going to have crazy moments that we're going to talk about. But one of the things that happens with couples who are successful realize, hey, we're, we're pink and blue. She's not wrong. She's just different. He's not wrong. He's just different. Not any more than pink is wrong for not being blue and blue's not wrong for not being pink. Second thing we're going to look at is Hollywood or the Holy Word. There comes a moment when each of us have to make a decision because there are moments in a relationship where I'm feeling unloved, I'm feeling disrespected, and I really don't have any great desire to be loving or respectful. I come out of some movie, I read some romance novel, I listen in on some talk show, and suddenly I'm beginning to realize as I read Facebook and other things that I'm, I'm not getting from this relationship what I think other people are getting. And we begin to hear these voices. We begin to have these feelings. And the question is, will we listen to the script or the scriptures. It's a challenge that all of us have because we begin to feel deeply disappointed that I'm not getting what maybe even God wants me to have. And so we have a choice, Hollywood's message or the Holy Word's message. And all of us have to make that decision. Will I trust that love and respect as a command to me is God's way for me to move forward on the relationship? Even if I'm feeling unloved and disrespected, would God have the holy audacity to expect me to do something like that? And then we're going to look at what I call the 80-20 ratio. 80-20 ratio. In other words, 20% of the time, this may not work. And in fact, Paul says that if you marry, you have not sinned, but you will have trouble. That 20% of the time, it's an arbitrary percentage, will have trouble. And the question is, how do we deal with those moments of trouble? And have we made a mistake when we have that trouble? Couples who have realized that 80% of the relationship can be wonderful, and they realize, hey, i got to roll with the 20% without letting that poison the 80% suddenly are doing this dance and experiencing the drama in a more joyful way. And then what about this? People say, hey, communication is the key to marriage. Well, I'm going to sh share with you, not communication, but mutual understanding. She speaks love language. He speaks respect talk. She speaks pink language. He speaks blue language. She speaks German. He speaks Spanish. But if they don't know the other's vocabulary, then you can talk Beautifully, but you're not going to be understood. Why? Because you don't speak the other's language. There has to be mutual understanding in order for there to be communication. And we'll look at that. And if we don't understand the love and respect languages, we're not going to have communication. And then lastly, my response is my responsibility. In other words, I am responsible to do the loving thing. And Sarah's responsible to do the respectful thing. But if you're like me, I want her to be responsible for my responses. And it doesn't really work too effectively. Also, this phrase is the key to power. Once we understand that we're not victims, we're not hopeless, helpless people, but God has empowered us, suddenly we begin to influence the relationship in a way we didn't think we had the power to do. So these are the five principles that we're going to be unpacking in this small group study. So let me make a few quick comments. Not wrong, just different. Um, because we are so different, the world wants to say we're the same, but we, you know, Jesus said, have you not read he who made them made them male and female, man and woman. We are different and we need to respect those differences. They're not wrong. They're just different. And we can be very dismissive in something that we don't have a vulnerability in. 
Hollywood versus Hollywood. I love this, right? Are we, this whole idea of not getting, this, that's the script. Well, I'm not getting what I thought I was going to get. Scripture is, what are you giving? That 80-20 ratio, and, and it could be 70-30, 60-40. A lot of times when couples come to us, it's more like 40-60, where the things that are they perceive as going wrong color the whole marriage. Right? We need to keep that in perspective. Mutual understanding. And then my response is my responsibility. We talked about that earlier. I, I include it here. The great thing about love and respect is Emerson gives us great language to use in our marriage. What happens if in, during a moment where you feel your husband has done something or said something, you would say, that felt unloving. Did I say something disrespectful? Wow. Th think what that does. That I, I can engage with that. Not you, you, you thoughtless person, you, you, that is that felt unloving. I'm not saying you meant that to be unloving. I'm saying that felt unloving. And then I'm going to say, did I contribute to that? Did I say something disrespectful? Same thing for uh, women or guys. That felt disrespectful. Did I say something unloving? You're, you're giving the benefit of the doubt here. You're engaging in positive conversation. Good stuff. Okay. Okay, so what does, so in our class, when we did this in our growth group, um, there, there was great discussion. Well, all right, we talk about this love and respect. What does it look like? I want, I want handles on this. I want to know concrete examples of this word respect and what does love really look like? So what does respect look like to a man and what does love look like to a woman? And there's five, six categories there. So Emerson puts these in six categories, respecting a man's desire to work and achieve, protect and provide, to um, exercise authority, to give insight, to uh, have a shoulder to shoulder relationship, and to respect his need for sex. Okay, so let's give some concrete examples of what respect looks like to a, to a man. And these are for women to consider. Cheer his successes, whether in business or hobbies. When you dated, you were his greatest cheerleader, and that changes as we get into the marriage. Um, so wives, I want you to, if your husband is next to you, reach out and grab his bicep. Grab his bicep. They all instantly flexed, right? I mean, that's just... That's in our DNA, right? We're going to flex, right? Because we, we want you to understand our strength. And that's, that's part of who we are, right? I didn't have to tell the men, make sure you flex when, when they do that. Uh, honor his authority in front of the kids. Um, tell him up front you need an ear to listen, not a solution. Guys, that'll save you countless countless arguments right there. If you just say, do you need me to listen or to provide a solution? Actually tell him you like him. The thing that a man fears most in his marriage is this world, word called contempt. It's the opposite of respect, a contemptuous attitude. Respond positively to sexual overture um, and acknowledge... So, that's the other part. We said women have a need that men don't, and that's for emotional release. Men have a need, and his biology demonstrates that for sexual release. And guess what? The only acceptable outlet in marriage is our spouse. So uh, let him acknowledge his sexual temptations without shaming him. This is huge. We are bombarded in today's world sexual temptation with images. Let him tell you that those things are difficult. Let, don't be offended when he says, man, I saw this today and I, you know, it, it, took me, it took me by surprise. He's not trying to say something that will make you feel uh, threatened. He's just acknowledging a vulnerability that he has. Is that all right? Not wrong, just different. A couple of points to the last two bullets before we then give ideas for women. Sexual overtures. 
Many of us struggle with body image and it doesn't come naturally for us. But again, out of love and respect, there is an example given where a man had to travel, right? Business trip going away and his wife made sure that they had awesome, great, amazing, jaw-dropping sex before, before he, he left. left. Okay, Why? Because men are very visually oriented. And we can't, women, we can't control how everybody dresses, what they see, or who they come in contact with. But what I can't control is I can leave an impression on my guy. Amen. Right? That when he's away, he is going to be thinking about, about that about night. Me. Think of a duck imprinting. Oh, yeah, baby. Yes, right? men imprint. And so that idea we do. And then again, our church has tried to talk about the struggles with sexual purity and be honest about what are faced. And many resources were offered about that. Can you be a partner, a helpmate to your guy that says, look, it seems that you are visually attracted to these things. I get that. I understand it. Let's talk about it, right? Or if you don't want to talk because men, you would rather talk to another man. I highly understand that and applaud that. But to bring your wife as a partner and admit you have a vulnerability, oh my gosh. That that helps us connect with that you. That is very dangerous like, oh, for a he's guy. He's transparent and he's vulnerable. I love it. Can you? Can, but can you imagine the opposite though? If a man is vulnerable in his marriage and tells his wife he has these vulnerabilities and she blows up, you'll never get him to talk about that again, ever. Yes. Okay, wives, you have this handout, and we also have examples. These are the things we have talked about. God designed both of us with abilities, gifts, desires, and needs. And yes, uh, our husbands can't meet all of our needs. God meets uh, our spiritual need and many of our needs. But this understanding for closeness, for connection, right, is huge for us. We are fiercely loyal and men, you think of the word respect. We women also think of respect, but in many ways, it's we're esteemed. We're valued like that treasured vase or goblet. Now, ladies, here's some examples uh, that we offer for men for you to look at. You have this list in front of you. I'm not going to go over all of that, but a couple, because it resonates with me, I'll go to the last one. Value her opinion, treasure her heart. So as we in marriage face things like, how do we make decisions in our family, right? When do we have to seek each other's opinion? As my husband is the head of my household, uh, does he make decisions without me? And is that okay? Right? You, we have to talk about these things. There are times when I want him to seek my input as his partner. Now, here's one of the things we are going to ask of you all because we are about to enter discussion time is as you see these lists, uh, there is a handout that's marked discussion questions for at home. OK, and we'll go into the discussion in a minute. What you can do, make it fun, make it a date night, go through these lists and actually ask each other which one of these resonate with you the most? Star them, check them, add to the list. But it can be fun to say, oh, here's what I love when you do this. When you rub my feet, you know, even if they're stinky, come on. <laughs> no yeah, way. Yeah. And he goes, no. <laughs> That's off the table. You know, take a shower first. <laughs> but there are things, when this guy holds my hand. What Sue meant to say. Yeah, yeah, I know. There it is. We don't rub stinky <laughs> feet. No. But it is, it is a fun way to communicate and just to share. So it's time for discussion. So you have these We've discussion questions. Please, at your table, just go through these and, and, and discuss the, this idea of spiritual headship and biblical submission and what does respect look like. Um, and, what man, what does this loving your wife in an understanding way look like?
So if you're at a table of two, please join with another table so you can have some meaningful discussion with others in the, in the hour. We have about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. I, I, I hear a great discussion. I walked around. There was great discussion. Thank you for engaging with this material. Um, but we, we do have to close. And so four key takeaways from tonight. God has very specific guidance. Despite what the world says, God has very specific guidance. Uh, husbands are to, uh, need respect and wives need love. Not wrong, just different. We are to submit to one another. I love Ephesians 5.21. That's the start of that doctoral thesis. And God's attitude is we are to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And then that last thing, we started with myths and truths, and, and this continues that theme. Are we listening to Hollywood or the Holy Word? Word? Are we listening to the script or are we listening to Scripture? Any final thoughts? Yes. My lovely bride reminded me, first and second of March next is weekend. next weekend is the AIM workshop. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to oversell this, but I do want to oversell it because it is the best workshop. We, in 14 years of doing marriage ministry, it is the best workshop we have done for 10 hours, for 10 or nine hours, basically nine and a half hours. It will be the best material on marriage that you engaged with it. It's the application that is really the, the part of it. So I encourage you, if you know someone that, that should, should be there, please let them know that it is open to everyone. Uh, the church has opened it up beyond just F FBC members. So please show up. Yes, ma'am. This is a great question. I don't know that there's a deadline. We're really soft with deadlines around <laughs> here. Um, the, it is March 1st and 2nd, so as long as it's before then, then I think yeah. we can get you in. Yes. We know that people wait to the last minute. We know that. There are limited spots, though. So if you wait till March or February 29th, might be looking then through you the might not yeah, might be looking have through the spot. windows. But... Yes, next week. So next Wednesday, we're going to do... Forgiveness and reconciliation. No lightweight topics there, folks. Forgiveness and reconciliation. So please come out. Let me. Yeah. <laughs> so let me close. Thanks for coming. Let me, let me close us real quickly. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this amazing group of uh, people here tonight. And we thank you for their diligence in showing up and wanting to pour into their own marriages and their own and so thank you, Lord, for your perfect design for marriage, for how you have wired us, not wrong, just different. Let us uh, teach us to, to apply that to our marriage, and may others see our marriage and want that. Reflect you, and may others see you in our marriage. Thank you. Bless us this week. May we be salt and light in a dark world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.